Eureka! Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today, we are going to talk about Chaos Corruption. Its many and varied types, how it works, how it spreads, and how one might be able to defend oneself against it. For whilst it is, of course, certainly true that Chaos's only constant is that it has no constants, there is still a certain rhyme and reason and method to even the most malignant of warp madness. But first, a word from our sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends. The premier, not dungeon-delving strategy game this time, but rather the dungeon-climbing game available on PC and mobile devices. As today, we are talking about the Doom Tower, which, despite its somewhat uninviting name, is a great place to acquire bundles of valuable loot. And the residents have no grounds to object, as the tower itself is one enormous prison complex. Created thousands of years ago, it contained three terrifying entities that simply could not be killed outright. And after all that time, the wards are starting to fail. In response, rotations were created, where every month a third of the tower is opened up to adventurers, allowing sallies into its halls to weaken the monsters that dwell inside. And a particularly driven group of heroes might even make it all the way to the top, where the Dark Fae, Eternal Dragon, or Frost Spider resides. There's other spooky stuff afoot this month as well, as Raid is holding a competition. Simply download Raid Shadow Legends using the links below, copy in your game player ID, and then venture over to raidyard.parium.com from October 15th to November 10th. Enter your player ID, muster your courage, and then venture into the haunted graveyard. Grab a shovel, pick a grave, and start digging, and you'll have a chance to dig up some amazing in-game items and even real-life prizes. From epic and legendary Halloween-themed raid champions to Amazon gift cards with a total value of $20,000. This is only open for new players' mind, but all players can still get involved by going to raidyard.clarium.com and find a special promo code for some in-game treats. So check out Raid today by clicking the link in the description below or by scanning the QR code on screen and you will get this free starter pack delivered to your inbox, which is right up here in the corner. And now, on with the lore. So, Chaos Corruption. Let us begin with the different types, because how you come into contact with its warping influence in large part determines your path forward. The most immediately obvious and straightforward of corruption is, of course, that corruption which is willing. And this can take many shapes. Obviously, if you're somebody who, well, goes out to summon demons and become a chaos cultist, then... <laughs> You're not going to be particularly worried about the corruption aspects, now are you? In fact, you are going to be viewing Chaos Corruption in the same way that the faithful of Chaos do. Not as a lingering poison or a malignant influence, but rather as the brief momentary attention of a deity. As a blessing, put quite simply. We are not going to talk too much about this form of Chaos Corruption, however, because we've already touched upon the subject many times discussing such things as Chaos Champions or Chaos Cults. Whilst becoming a Chaos Cultist is uh, certainly not a straightforward undertaking, considering that the entirety of Imperial society is going to be hell-bent on stopping you, it is nevertheless not quite what we're talking about when it comes to corruption, is it? But there are other forms of voluntary chaos corruption, and by voluntary we can broadly divide it into two general categories. The first is driven by desire or ambition, when somebody wants something really, really badly. Let's take, for example, everybody's favorite, desire. 
Let's say that some random underhive ganger really, really, really wants the hottest chick in the gang. But she's of course the exclusive property of the gang chief, and he's about 250 pounds of muscle and cybernetic implants, so that could be a challenge. In which case, you might look around for any and all advantages you can get. Some gangers are going to rely on all trustworthy methods like, oh, I don't know, shooting the guy in the back of the head when he isn't looking. But others might try for something a pinch more subtle. Perhaps our hive ganger is nurturing dreams of running away with the girl in the middle of the night and seeking their fortune some other place in the spire, far outside the grasping grips of their ex-gang. And he's heard about an old woman further down near the scabbier parts of town who just so happens to be selling love potions. Now that does sound a little bit too good to be true, doesn't it? Odds are it's some old crazy person who brews whatever they find between their toenails that particular evening and sells it off to keep themselves in soup money. Or, more maliciously, it could even be a straight-up scam, preying upon the naivete of some mid-spire tards. But our ganger tells himself that he's far too clever to fall for any of that nonsense, he's seen it all, and so he ventures down into the lower reaches on the off chance that it's actually real. Is a bit off-put by the woman's choice of interior decor, however, weird squirming pink symbols on the walls, etc. I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. And the old woman puts on a sufficiently mystical display, some puffs of smoke here or there, and some weird spell-like chanting, not to mention again that fancy glow right there on the inside of the bottle. Thoroughly convinced then, our young ganger purchases a potion, and the next great feast, he slips a couple of drops of demonic date rape drug into his fancied flower lines drink, and voila! It works. She falls madly in love with him, cannot wait to run away together, and so they do. Bing bang, bada boom, happily ever after. Because I'm sure there's not going to be any nasty after effects that will see our ganger tied to a table a couple weeks later with his wife standing over him with a kitchen knife. <laughs> of course not. That kind of stuff only happens in fairy tales, after all, the old school ones. But for the purposes of our discussion, the question then becomes, let's assume that the ingredients of this potion are not entirely herbal in nature, shall we say. Our young ganger, of course, has no idea about any of this. He probably has no idea what chaos is. He probably, in all due likelihood, doesn't even know the word chaos. Certainly not its actual connotations or realities, as the Imperium tends to um, subscribe to the idea that the less the general populace knows about chaos, the less they can be tempted by it. But nevertheless, he purchased the potion and he used it, blissfully unaware that uh, chaotic cum was now cursing through his cherished sweetheart's veins. Now, regardless of whether or not aforementioned Ganger gets an interesting symbol carved into his chest with aforementioned kitchen knife in the future, the question then really becomes, does this action, the purchasing of the potion, corrupt the Ganger? Because he has now, in our little theoretical scenario, used a chaotic potion. He has used the power of chaos, even in its far more distilled variant. Is our young ganger now corrupted? And if so, to what degree? Can he shake it off? Can he ignore it? Will he even notice it? And of course we could add then on tons of other qualifiers. What if, for example, to complete the potion the old lady needed a drop of his blood to bind into it? Or maybe she needed a lock of the woman's hair, which would in turn essentially bind her to chaos. Where precisely does the line run? Well, 
nobody actually knows. In fact, there doesn't seem to be any firm line at all. We have examples like the soul drinkers, and I will be returning to that example frequently, I do imagine, who were not only corrupted by chaos, but who actively fought for chaos, in chaos's name, to complete chaos's objectives, who received chaos's blessings and rejoiced in them, and yet still were able to shake off chaos's influence and reject it fully, fight against it, defeat their patron, and remain loyal. Now, Granted, those were space marines, of course, hardly comparable to our gang Yijuvi here, but still it is an example. On the other hand, we also know that exposure to chaos artifacts can almost instantaneously corrupt others. There is one account during the Sabbat World's Crusade where an Imperial Guardsman caught a fragment of a homemade and very crude little molten iron statue wrought in the image of one of the Great Four. And by caught, I mean he got it embedded in his neck. <laughs> An hour or so later, the poor unfortunate guardsman turned into a savage monster and bit the head of one of his friends. Now, you may immediately argue apples to oranges, and fair enough, fair enough, but the point I'm getting across is that the line for what constitutes chaos corruption can be very difficult to determine, and even acts that seem immediately innocent might not be. You don't have to be a lunatic crazy person dressing in robes and chanting verses in your mother's basement, begging fantasy Satan to rise up from the depths and bugger you in your supple behind to get corrupted. Yet at the same time, you also can't simply be corrupted out of absolutely nowhere either. See, again, the line. The one that is so difficult to discern. If we work our way through the various extremes, then we might happen upon its actual location, or at the very least a rough approximation. So, with the case of our ganger in mind, his corruption, if he received any, was in all due likelihood very minor. After all, all he did was purchase something that might be a very, very, very low-level chaos artifact. One that he then near immediately used, thus ridding himself of it. Now we could get into details as to whether or not he'd be continuously corrupted by his wife and so on and so on, but let's assume that's where the tale ended. He may have received a small dosage of corruption, almost in the idea of radiation. It's not a perfect analogy, but it sort of works, right? You are close to an object that holds chaos powers, thus if you stay near it for too long, you imperil your soul. Bearing in mind the previous example of the shard of uh, the crudely carved little icon of a chaos god, that certainly seems to have some sort of truth to it, absolutely. But at the same time, looking at the other example of the soul drinkers, it also clearly is not a hard and fast perfect rule. It may, however, lead our ganger, presuming he lives, to seek out other shortcuts. Okay, let's say that his wife doesn't sacrifice him in a bloody BDSM kink ritual, but instead they actually live for quite some time. But needing to escape from their previous gang and trying to find a new life, etc., is a lot harder than either one of them had ever imagined. So he hears another rumor, this time of another magician who is apparently connected to the previous one, or maybe he's even contacted by the witch who's like, hey, I see you've happened upon some hard times there, Sunny Jim Jim. You know, I can help you. I've got friends in certain places. If you just do a couple of minor errands for us, then we can absolutely see you fed and housed. Well, that's awfully tempting, and it's awfully convenient as well, and simple. They won't ask for much. Some simple delivery work, maybe a small package in the weird shape of a dagger, perhaps. Uh, maybe something a little bit squishy and gooey that leaks a bit of red jam, who knows. You know, general issue stuff. Nothing overtly chaotic or heretical in its immediate nature, right? But now he's getting in deeper. 
Now he's carrying out actions for and in favor of his masters without even realizing who those masters actually are. In this case, the kill's corruption will begin to seep in to a greater and greater degree. This is, uh, once more, the radiation theory, where being handed a small patch, for example, with a weird and intricate symbol on it. You, know, you, know, you don't know what it is, you've got no idea about chaos theory or anything like that, and you're simply told by the person who pays you very well to wear it. Okay, fair, and so you do. In this case, you might then have, very soon, an honest-to-god chaos contest. And the key concept here, in my not too humble opinions anyways, is intent. Even if it is very diffuse and undirected intent. Our ganger is now doing something in the service of his masters, even though he has no idea who those masters are, or even potentially what service he is rendering to them. He is nevertheless acting in their interests. There are several examples of this throughout Warhammer and Warhammer 40k history of, uh, for example, one from the Horus Heresy, a certain famous painter who was just not quite managing to recreate the exact shade of a certain color she saw somewhere in a Chaos Temple, incidentally, and so eventually she, she looks down at her palms and goes like, hold on, it's just a little bit of a slice down her palm and oh there it is, that's the shade of red I'm looking for. Let's just mix that with a little bit of paint and you're on a one-way trip to Crazyville. This also touches upon another aspect, an ingredient to intent, namely ambition. Now ambition in and of itself isn't going to corrupt you. It can, but merely wanting to become the best at something is not an inherently bad thing. In fact, it's an inherently positive thing. However, when you're trying to become, say, the world's finest fighter, even that is not necessarily an inherently chaotic ideal, but if you start to embrace chaos to do so, then you have alloyed ambition with intent. You have added to it. Now you are intending to do something that will eventually benefit chaos. And again, it could be something incredibly diffuse, like taking on a certain pre-fight ritual that has certain occult overtones, or simply the mentioning of a particular war deity. And again, you might have no idea what this means. You might have no idea that this deity is an aspect, no matter how minor or tertiary, to corn, but simply doing so adds intent to the otherwise relatively innocent act of ambition. But this is not enough in and of itself either, as I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking, but hold on a second there. If this is true, if doing something to benefit the four great powers with the intentions of doing that thing, even if you don't know necessarily that what you are doing is benefiting the great powers, then doesn't this mean that some things as simple as waging war will feed corn, and thus every soldier will invariably be corrupted? Because after all, corn cares not from whence the blood flows? Ah, yes indeed. That is the big old elephant in the room, isn't it? And in many cases, Yes, waging war can be an act of worship to corn. We know of several minor civilizations in the 41st millennium, for example, that show no overt signs of corruption. There have even in fact been cases where Imperial Guard regiments have been levied from feudal worlds for years and years and centuries and millennia without ever really realizing that they're actually chaos worshippers. Until eventually, of course, the corruption reaches a certain point and they all go batshit insane almost simultaneously. There are also examples in the Warhammer fantasy world, we're gonna use both examples here incidentally because chaos is kind of a universal thing in both universes, where certain Norsken tribes worship deities that are very clearly aspects of the chaos gods, and yet they're not actually chaos worshippers, not truly. When the bastards come down from the true north, they will slaughter, rape, and pillage their villages just as they will the Kislevits. And in fact, on many an occasion, these Norsken have been fighting alongside the Kislevits to protect their communities against the true Northerners. 
This is again where intent must come back into the picture. Now, I have long argued that what gives the Chaos Gods power is in essence some form of worship. Because again, if every act of violence fed corn, then there would be no resisting corn. Simple as. If every time you smacked somebody over the head with a roll of newspaper because they were being annoying fed corn, if every little microaggression, if every time you were stuck in a supermarket line fed corn, he would be unstoppable. Not to mention the obvious problem, of course, that fighting corn who feeds off fighting would in and of itself be utterly pointless as all you would be doing is granting him additional powers. And in essence, if this was actually the case, then the moment you grabbed for the lasgun to ventilate those shits painting a six-foot corn swastika in your yard, you yourself would look at that and go, Hey, you know what? That does look like a pretty swell extracurricular activity. I should join in. And since that doesn't happen, we know that there must be some X-Factor element to all of this. And that is intent, directed intent, or worship, if you will. As we can bring it back yet again to the Soul Drinkers, everything they did, even when they were fighting directly at a demon's behest in the service of Chaos, they did so with the intent of serving the God Emperor. They fully and honestly believed that their mutations were blessings. They fully and honestly believed that they were the chosen ones who were being spoken to by the Emperor. They fully and wholly did all of this, no matter no matter how ridiculous it might seem in retrospect, in the belief that they were doing it in his name. And it is because of this intent that despite having done so much in the service of Chaos, despite having accepted Chaos's blessings as a gift, they could still remain loyal. And again, they were space marines. They're special, right? Well, there is another name for this phenomenon. The Armor of Contempt. This, of course, is again from the Sabbat World's Crusade, when a certain Colonel Commissar, along with a group of his loyal men, went down to a chaos-held world and spent a great deal of time on that planet, surrounded by all manners of nasty chaos nonsense, and yet re-emerged untainted despite the Inquisition's fervent attempt to find some sort of evidence to the contrary. And of course, if you're a fan of Gaunt's ghosts, you will no doubt know that Armor of Contempt speaks to a real phenomenon. When the Colonel Commissar explained why he and his men could somehow have re-emerged without another limb or three, he explained that he had clad himself in the Armor of Contempt. The contempt for chaos, the contempt for everything that is chaos, an automatic and absolute disgust of everything that belongs to the arch enemy. And through this armor, no taint could possibly slip. Which of course vibes very well with my own theory of intent being an absolutely necessary component of actually feeding the chaos gods, or at the very least, to become corrupted by their powers. But if it's really that easy, why doesn't everyone do it? Why is chaos even a problem? Surely any soldier worth his salt is going to be thoroughly indoctrinated in the Imperial faith? Surely he will dedicate every waking moment, every last breath to the God Emperor, right? Well, unfortunately, humanity doesn't quite work that way. And maintaining an absolute contempt for chaos at all times is more difficult than it might sound. And this also depends on the environment, too. The Colonel Commissar did have a little bit of an advantage as, apparently, allegedly, a certain natural elements may have aided his men in resisting the taint of chaos as well. Moth venom, incidentally, which sounds like a bit of a leap of logic, but hey, it's entirely possible. 
When a man is weak, when he is tired, when he is dirty, when he is hungry, when he is wounded, a man becomes weakened. And as his psychological state begins to weaken, so too does his resistance to temptation. And temptation is ever the narrow wedge of chaos. Take another example of the 13th Mordant during the Black Crusade of Jihar the Lacerator. The 13th was a regiment of long and proud historical prowess, having been raised and annihilated multiple times, but still, it seemed to have done pretty damn well. It was deployed into the path of a Black Crusade. Now this is a trying combat situation even for the most experienced and veterans of troops, and more often than not it is a very temporary deployment which we'll get to in a second. The Mordant, bearing in mind their deployment area, were equipped very, very well with Munitorum sanctioned priests and commissars to maintain morale and the spiritual sanctity of the men. They were given every possible preparation, they were given every specialist, they were given every sermon, and they were constantly being followed up by these individuals who knew exactly what to look for and exactly how to reinforce their charges armor of contempt. And the 13th did pretty damn well. They had multiple successful engagements, but slowly but surely they began to change. To begin with it was simple things, soldier things, like gathering up various trophies from the defeated enemies. It started with uh, a handgun here and there, normal, natural. Every soldier wants a backup piece and if they're simply scattered around the battlefield you'll grab one or two of course. They started picking up enemy used weaponry. Again your last gun is out of reach and so you grab an enemy weapon. Fair enough, fair enough. They started looting their supplies, their food, their water, their power packs, their hand grenades and explosives. Again, so circumstances dictate, right? But then it moved on into trophies of a more human nature. A tooth, a finger, a horn from a particularly repulsive mutant. And all too soon they were carrying fetishes. Chopped off hands, polished skulls, eyeballs, or dangling little chains of ears. And that was the point at which the Mordant 13th were judged to be too far gone and bombarded from orbit by the Imperial Navy. Which might sound a pinch extreme. They had just won multiple victories for the Imperium. They had proven to be an extraordinarily effective formation, specializing in combat engineers, and they built it to take on heavily entrenched chaos forces. Not to mention, this was in the midst of a Black Crusade, a minor one, but still, surely wasting manpower like this is beyond criminal, right? Well, the Inquisition has got a great deal of experience with this. They know just about the tipping point, and they'll get in there a little bit before it goes over the edge, so as to make sure that a regiment, no matter how faithful, no matter how worthwhile it may once have been, cannot start to turn their skills against the very same Imperium that they served so bravely mere months previously. This is common operating procedure during a Black Crusade. Any regiment or formation that begins to display signs of combat stress is summarily dealt with. This in turn then seems to lend a great deal of credence to the radiation theory. Right? If you are operating in an environment that is sufficiently suffused with chaos, then falling prey to it is merely a question of time. Possibly so. In fact, both may be true. Chaos may have an innate effect on the environment around it. In fact, we know it does. Even things like plants and animals can be corrupted, so clearly this isn't purely a psychological aspect either, or no, it does have a psychological aspect. More correctly, it does not necessarily have a purely faith-based component. Because, of course, a 
cat does not understand faith. <laughs> A dog, or a jungle animal, a monkey, does not understand the ideas of organized religion. At the very least, I'd be very surprised if they did. But that also, of course, then opens up another question. Do they need to? In a world where God is real, where we know for a fact that God is real and he hates you, do you need to believe in God for faith, quote-unquote, to affect you? I don't know, especially bearing in mind the specific rules of the 41st millennium. Since the warp can affect the material world, as again we know it can, there is a certain amount of credence to the radiation theory, but it might still require intent as well, there's the thing. If Gaunt can survive on a chaos-infested world for a period of time that nobody should believe was possible, and yet hardened combat troops can also succumb, maybe it is simply a matter of amount. If you are fighting in a Black Crusade, the radiation that hits you is so overwhelming that the tiny little temptations, the little whispering voices in the back of your mind, get so insistent, so constant, that you give in almost subconsciously. The, the temptation to just, oh god, I, I just killed this enormous monster mutant, oh boy, he's massive, god, how did I kill such a beast, oh, he's got an enormous horn too, wow, wouldn't that look amazing if I saw that off, oh boy, everyone in my platoon would love me for this, they'd, they'd sing my praises, that sort of temptation, and then you take it off. And now you have a trophy of a chaos creature. You have reveled in the slaughter of your enemy. You have created a fetish out of that horn. And who is to say where that little whisper of temptation came from? For surely a good imperial soldier knows better, right? Whereas in the case of Gaunt, well, he's a bit more of a straight-laced lad, and he may simply not have received quite enough radiation. Though bearing in mind the man survived being flayed alive by the blood pact during interrogation, I don't know if there is such a thing as enough chaos radiation for Ibram Gaunt. We should also then debate the idea of chaos as a very slow corrupting force, as a poison, as this too is a very interesting element of it. In the Liber Chaotica, the favourite book of mine to quote of course, there is a fascinating portion in the book about Nurgle, where a sister of Sigma describes a certain pox as something unnatural, not as a disease, and by pox we do mean plague, as in disease here, but she describes it not as a virulent disease, not as a bacteriological or virological phenomenon, but rather as literal demons, tiny, tiny microscopic creatures chewing away at the host body, eating it from the inside cell by cell, and thus utterly and completely immune to any traditional medicine or administrations. Only prayer and faith and a pinch of magic can cure Nurgle's rot. Now, Nurgle's rot in and of itself is a catch-all term for a wide variety of demonic-based diseases, but again, you catch my drift. What is particularly interesting, however, is that this is an ailment not designed to kill the host. Not immediately, anyways. It is not a swift killer. It is not a population depleter. Well, it can be. Nurgle has certainly played with those as well including a zombie plague that functions against orcs, incidentally, in case you're wondering. But rather, it seemed to cause the victim tremendous anguish. Big, fat, pulsating boils all over his body, painful, filled with pus, his blood burning, an incredibly high fever, and aches in every limb, their eyes filling up with goo and disgusting awful, diarrhea, everything designed to sap the person's will as they lie there in pain, shitting themselves, vomiting uncontrollably, and generally speaking, wondering if it wouldn't be better to simply be dead. 
making it a psychological attack as much as a physical one. The entire point, again, is to weaken the victim as much as possible until just the slightest whisper suggesting that there is an alternative to suffering. In fact, you could live an eternity without ever knowing pain ever again. And all you need to do is to praise Grandfather Nurgle, who doesn't wish to see you suffer. He doesn't want to see you in pain. He wants to help you. He wants to take it all away. And after a few weeks on death's door and yet being unable to pass through it, a lot of people are going to take him up on his kind offer. Now this could result in our unfortunate friend exploding in a tide of bile and sinew, revealing a demon of Nurgle standing where he had once been laying. But chaos is not always quite so spectacular. In many cases, it will be far more advantageous for the four in the north to instead do something a pinch more subtle, recruiting agents and servants and cultists to continue to poison human society. And this is of course where the slow corruption comes into the matter yet again. Let us say, for example, that a city, an imperial city or an empire town or whatever, is undergoing some hardships, as is usual, right? They have a shortage of food or water, maybe, or perhaps they lack funds to purchase next year's sewing material and so on. The countless little hardships that befall tiny communities all throughout feudal worlds. <laughs> which uh, does describe a frighteningly large percentage of the Imperium as well, incidentally. During such times of hardships, individuals or entire communities may seek aid from a wide variety of sources, the overwhelming majority of which will probably be legitimate, be it banking organizations, local lords or luminaries, etc, etc. But many a chaos cult has also infiltrated communities under the guise of legitimacy. Uh, community organizations, unofficial churches, or faiths. Indeed, there are entire religious groups within the Imperium that are tolerated as offspins of the Imperial faith that have turned out to be something a fair bit darker. This is, of course, a favored tactic of various gene stealer cults, presenting themselves as good, honest worshippers of the God Emperor, whilst in reality their uh, eight armed version of the Emperor is a pinch less wholesome than all that. Chaos cultists, as well, adopt this tactic quite frequently, although it is a bit of a dangerous one. See, the Tyranids have the advantage of being able to, well, straight up brainwash and psychically dominate a lot of people, which makes sure that they don't ask any question as to where the other six arms come from. Chaos, however, often does not have this luxury, and so need to clad themselves in a fair bit more of a guise of innocence. A simple gathering of community representatives that want the best for everybody. When somebody's having a hard time, like a, a farmer not being able to pay the debt to his landlord, they might come over there and offer him a, a hand. And all he needs to do is, you know, uh, again, deliver a few packages. Maybe take part in their weekly sermons. You know, simple stuff. And as more and more people gather, the sermons sound just fine. There's nothing particularly weird about it. It's perhaps a bit more fire and brimstone than the usual preacher's fare, but there's nothing overtly sinister. Slowly but surely, then more favors are being traded. More advantages are being taken. People begin to think that, you know what, these, these guys have got something going on here. There's more and more of them every day. They seem to command a, a pretty serious amount of respect, maybe even financial power in the local community, if I join them I'll be set for life. And so the circle begins, one layer at a time. First you're invited, then you're recruited, then you are initiated into certain secrets here and there. Nothing serious at first, of course, again. It might take 
a decade plus for a person who attends one sermon to eventually be wielding a dagger in a basement somewhere over a prostrate member of aforementioned community. It can take a very long time, and the majority of members will never even have the faintest clue what they're doing. They will simply be cover for the rest of the cult's activities. This can, however, spiral quite out of control rather rapidly, as there are tales of entire hive cities turning to chaos seemingly damn near overnight, with murder cults rising up from every street corner, apparently, attacking the rest of the population. Bearing in mind, you don't actually need to turn that large a percentage of the population before everything goes to hell in a handbasket. If you manage to mobilize, say, 5-6% of a highest population, that is an enormous quantity of people. And if you manage to get all of them to be violent at the same time, it is going to spread a lot of fear, which is going to increase your influence in the good old-fashioned warp term. As we mentioned previously, as people go hungry, as people go scared and cold, their resistances diminish swiftly. Until mere hours or days or perhaps weeks later, the cult has grown significantly by people who are not even aware of what they're doing. All of this is the slow, seeping poison of chaos, the thing that might take years and years to cultivate until it all blossoms in a crescendo. And speaking of sudden and violent eruptions, there is of course one other form of chaos corruption we need to talk about as well. We've addressed um, incidental corruption, when you don't actually know whether or not you're being corrupted at all, but some minute action begins the, uh, the wheel of spinning. We've talked about more directed corruption, when people are creating schemes specifically to begin spreading the power of the warp. But what if we go one step further? Because warp powers are clearly corrosive in a way. They are corrosive to the soul. Being exposed to them for an extended period of time wears away at your senses, as we've seen with the cults, for example. And you do not build up a tolerance to this stuff. But what if you're exposed to it all at once, very, very suddenly? What if we skip the whole, like, tricking you into it part, the whole intent part, right? Because that's been kind of the cornerstone here. You need to carry out some sort of action with the intent of benefiting either the Chaos Powers themselves or whomsoever is scheming on their behalf to truly start becoming a victim of this. There needs to be something beyond merely doing something that a Chaos Power finds good. You know, um, the Slinity example, we've already talked about this, the blood, uh, blood God, but there are less overtly violent ones, Slinesh. There is another excellent excerpt from the Liebe Chaotica, where a certain nobleman is talking about why he worships Slanesh. And he simply says, I, what, do you, what do you mean, why do I worship Slanesh? Come on, Slanesh is a god who asks nothing of me. She's not demanding I go on crusades in the north. She's not demanding that I beat to death heretics with a giant war mallet or anything like that. She's not demanding I better myself or do impossible things. All Slanesh asks is that I enjoy what I do. She asks that I take pleasure in the food that I eat, in the wine that I drink, in the music that I listen to. That is all Sinesh wants of me. Why would you not worship such a god? But of course, that is where it begins. The corrupting force of chaos. I realize, incidentally, we haven't been talking much about the fall itself because, well, I imagine you can figure that part out pretty well. Once the chaos corruption really sets in, you're going to get very extreme very, very quickly. Aforementioned Noble, for example, started out with, well, you know, so then she's just asking that I enjoy my dinner, fair enough, but then every day thereafter, your perfect steak just 
didn't taste quite as good as the day before. And the next day thereafter, you know, it's, it's lacking a little bit something. And so you start spicing it up a little bit more and a little bit more. And yet still, it keeps losing flavor. It keeps losing that pizzazz that it had on the first day. That little bit of something special. And all of a sudden, your life becomes dark and dreary and drab. Until again, you realize the missing ingredient... <laughs> usually is somebody else's suffering or some form of an extreme that's the thing with Slanesh. yeah she asks that you enjoy your food but um when the food loses a bit of its pizzazz every time she's then going to ask that you just add a little bit of an extra ingredient to it you know maybe the tears of children would be a mm, perfect little topping onto my ham and cheese sandwich in the case of the nobleman, incidentally, he didn't stop at the tea, as I'm pretty sure he ate the actual child and, you know, just general issue people around him, which uh, got the Inquisition or the Witch Hunters, more correctly, in that particular setting, to get a little bit suspicious as the peasantry were disappearing into his house and not re-emerging. Even as the uh, pile of awful and detritus outside of his house continued to grow as well. But we are wandering somewhat off the point, as even in the case of our man-eating Marquis, the process of transforming him from a bon vivant gourmet into a, you know, South Pacific Islander was a gradual process. But what happens if somebody is actually trying to convert you full stop immediately, just hitting you with a dose of warp magic, a forcible corruption? What then? Is it even possible to do this? Is the, the human body a, a vessel, as the example we talked about earlier, and you could simply just fill it up with chaos and voila, you've got yourself a traitor? Well, perhaps, but there are certainly exceptions to this rule as well. A little bit about the whole corrosive nature of chaos again, the armor of corruption and so on, as we have individuals who have survived direct contact with chaos for extended periods of time. We even have examples from, say, for example, the Ultramarines series, where regular humans, and Space Marines too, were able to exist within the realm of chaos for an extended period of time and on a chaos world and yet remain not uh, entirely normal but not complete chaos crazies either and Uriel Ventris of course not only managed to survive but return from a chaos held world without seemingly being any worse for wear. And considering that his stay on that demon world included him being sewn into a demon womb, I, I, I think we can quite safely say that he took a pretty damn big dollop of corruption. But on the other hand, we also have accounts of, again, entire hive cities being turned virtually overnight. Now, once more, that might simply be expediency. If chaos is running the show, then surely joining in with the chaos is simply a survival mechanism, right? And for many Imperial citizens on occupied worlds, it is. If chaos takes over your planet and becomes the ruling power, the administration, then for your average citizens, well, the best way to deal with that is in many cases to just get along with it. Especially as, whilst chaos can most assuredly be a rather brutal overlord, oh boy can it, to some it's not actually that bad. For some, it simply is just a change in leadership. We have examples, again, from the Savat worlds, where certain planets, they viewed chaos as just another master, and in some cases, as a better master than the Imperium. Now, these were usually those in privileged classes that chaos couldn't simply use as, oh, you know, fuel for the furnaces, essentially, as chaos tends to be rather you know, rough on the peasantry, most assuredly so, but still, chaos is not necessarily an all-consuming, annihilating force. That is one of those interesting things. Nobody ever really considers that chaos society might have infrastructure, logistics, um, you know, 
farms, chicken farms, hen houses, etc. But it does. The overwhelming majority of Chaos' servants are simple human beings who require food and water and entertainment and all of these various things that other humans require as well. And so for a Chaos War host to function, it's actually going to need to provide these things. Not to mention, you know, necessities for warfare, uh, power cells, replacement boots, uh, clothing patches, uh, buffing kits, cleaning kits, uh, oils of all manners to lubricate weapons, to lubricate uh, knives, not lubricate, but, you know, polish knives to keep them from rusting, etc. Because a rusted blade, no matter how chaotic it might be, tends to be kind of shit in a close quarters engagement, so on and so on. The countless little logistical requirements, even of the evil bad guys in the story. But, again, we're wandering somewhat off the point here. We know then that there are examples where people can be corrupted very, very swiftly. Um, say, for example, being near a major chaos event. Take the Mordant, again, that we talked about previously. They were corrupted relatively quickly during the Crusade, and they were still in active opposition to chaos. Imagine being forced to witness countless chaotic rituals, being forced to bathe essentially in the dark eerie glow of the warp day in and day out. How fast would it be to turn a loyal citizen of the Imperium into a slave to the Dark Gods? Who knows? The answer probably varies from person to person. For the average dredgers of the Imperium, who have no understanding of chaos and then for no way to really clad themselves with the armor of contempt, it might be very easy to see chaos as, well, yet another overlord, as perhaps even a source of salvation in dark times. Once more, somebody who is vulnerable spiritually is going to be far quicker and easier to corrupt. Whereas someone who understands just what selling one's soul to chaos truly means is going to be very hesitant and very difficult to corrupt. As surely, showing such an individual the continued horrors of the warp would only steal their resolve. At least until simple human endurance can go no longer. Until simple pain, torture, and horror overcomes any rational sense. When the fear of tomorrow is no longer as potent as the fear of what's going to happen in the next five minutes. And then there is also, of course, a little bit of a cheat, too. Because we're talking about chaos corruption now. We're talking about your soul being stolen by the dark gods, of willingly giving oneself over to them. But you could also circumvent this point by simply possessing the person in question. You'd still be corrupted, probably far more effectively so than through the traditional means as well. And you would still be pledging quite a bit of yourself to the Dark Gods, as we have seen examples with uh, even Sisters of Battle being brainwashed and dominated and controlled by particularly powerful psychers to carry out the wishes of Chaos. Surely in such an instance, their soul could not possibly remain entirely untainted, right? Oh, considering those sisters committed suicide immediately upon being released, I figure they might agree to. Which raises a further interesting question, doesn't it? Let's say that you are possessed, and let's say that your body now commits the most heinous acts imaginable. What does that do to your soul? Because you're not the one doing it, you're not the one in charge. Is your soul still corrupted simply by being in the body, without even actually doing the things that you are seeing? Will merely witnessing them in some way or form sully your soul? Will having it be done with your physical form somehow sully your soul? Well, honestly, we're probably getting a bit too esoterical there, as, at least offhand, I can't think of any good examples that could really settle that. But, 
to summarize a little bit here at the end, by and large, it does appear as if chaos corruption is near universally a slow grinding process. And whilst it can most assuredly be forced, it is rare. And it is rare still for it to be an instantaneous conversion, if indeed that is even possible. Mostly, it is temptation. It is the drive to get somebody to commit to something willingly, even if they have no true understanding of what they are committing themselves to. Certain acts, certain ways of behavior, certain means of achieving one's objective will inherently be favored by the dark gods. And these need to be more specific than merely committing violence or merely committing even debauchery. There needs to be an intent behind it for somebody to begin to sully their soul. Otherwise, we should all be damned. But the precise nature of that intent, how it is achieved, how it's carried out, how it forms and how it is encouraged, can vary tremendously upon circumstance, upon the individual in question upon their individual desires, hopes, and wishes, as even something so virtuous as good intentions can pave the road to certain very hot places. And yet, simultaneously, intent can also be the soul's finest shield, allowing even regular human beings to survive extended exposure to tremendously high levels of chaos radiation. Again, somewhat defeating the radiation theory. I much prefer viewing it as a psychological threat, as a danger of the mind, rather than as any real physical thing as the radiation theory seems to suggest. It is a slow, gnawing thing, but it is a slow, psychological, gnawing thing. It is like being given a bottle of poisoned water whilst in the middle of a desert. You're thirsty. You're about to die from thirst, and yet you know that if you drink the water in front of you, you will only die faster. In fact, not only will you do f die faster, you will die far more horribly as well. But there's only so long the human mind can keep staring at that cold, delicious-looking bottle of fluids before it starts to ignore the fact that it might be laced with cyanide. A bit of a crude analogy, I agree, but I think it gets the point across relatively well. Chaos is a poison, but a poison that you must administer yourself, as it is very, very difficult, and not particularly effective, to force it upon someone. And with that, you should now have a much better idea of chaos corruption through our little brainstorming experiment and flow of consciousness today. Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you very much for listening, and I do hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.